So I'd like to introduce Jessica Schulte. She is the newest addition to our team and following a fellowship at UCSF. Um, uh, she's a clinical instructor with a specific interest in the topic that she will be discussing, which is the management of adolescent and young adult patients and their specific challenges. Thanks, Suzanne, and thanks for that great overview, Nancy Ann, and that um, the wonderful schedule that you've put together for us today. Um, today, I'll be talking about adolescent and young adult tumors. I have no disclosures. So as a bit of background, the adolescent and young adult population has become of increasing um, interest among cancer providers. This is defined as a vulnerable population um, with a wide range of ages from age 15 to 39. And they are at a transition point, both in terms of their medical care, so transitioning between pediatric and adult providers, and at an important transition point in their life, navigating many of the milestones that even patients without brain tumors have to navigate. It is a quite a substantial amount of the new brain tumor and other CNS diagnoses that we see in a year. So based on the central brain tumor registry data in 2020, this population comprised about 11,000 of the new diagnoses out of a total of approximately 84,000. So um, it is a substantial group of people and we need to do a better job of looking towards their individual needs. There's many issues of, at stake with this population. Uh, some here are early diagnosis, so often there could be a delayed diagnosis because cancer is not considered as a diagnosis in these younger patients, getting appropriate access to specialty care, um, uh, navigating that gap between pediatric and adult care in particular, and in the context of finding a brain tumor specialist. The tumors that affect this population have unique genetic and epigenetic features that can vary from younger and older patients. These patients can also overlap with a, a group of tumor predisposition syndromes. So often in these predisposition syndromes, tumors can arise during this age range and manifest their effects. The approach to these tumors can be different based on which provider is taking care of the patients. There can be problems with clinical trial enrollment in these patients, and actually the group from about 15 to 25 have decreased enrollment in clinical trials, despite the fact that they actually have overlapping eligibility between some pediatric and adult trials. And of course, there are survivorship issues as these patients have many long-term sequelae of their tumors and treatments that have to be navigated over their life. I'm going to just focus on a couple of these things today. So this is again looking at the central brain tumor registry information from 2020. And you can see here on the left the distribution of all malignant and non-malignant CNS tumors. When we're focusing in just on the AYA population, the distribution is a little bit different. There is some overlap in the tumors that we see, of course, so many pituitary tumors, meningioma, and glioblastoma. But in addition to that, there are more prevalent um, types that aren't seen in older adults, um, for example. So these can be both uh, benign or indolent growing tumors, such as pilocytic astrocytomas and neuroepithelial tumors, as well as more malignant behavior behaving tumors such as embryonal tumors under which medulloblastoma is categorized. This is looking at malignant histologies in particular, and you can see the breakdown on the left by age group. Um, here in the middle is the AYA group, age 15 to 39. So um, the histologies in the malignant types are not all that different from the adult. There's less lymphoma and more impenable tumors. The survival curves, as you can see here, are fare a little bit better than the older adults and a little bit worse than the younger patients on average. But of course, this breaks down by subtype of the tumor. So uh, for AYA patients that have anaplastic astrocytoma or glioblastoma, they fare a little better with a lower hazard risk ratio of survival. And with the tumor histologies on the right, diffuse astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, and lymphoma, they fare worse than children, but still better than the older adults. 
So what about the approach to treatment in these patients? So as I said, you know, often these patients are falling through the gap in care that happens between pediatric and adult transitions in medical care. And really it can be quite dependent on where the patient lands for their medical home. So imagine an 18 or 19 year old, they could easily go to either pediatric or adult providers and the options for their treatment can vary quite a bit between those two settings. So just wanted to share an example of that. Dr. Bush just gave an excellent overview of our standard of care for high-grade glioma in adult, provi adult providers. So this is based on the STU protocol from 2005, so now 15, 16 years old, in which high-grade glioma was treated with concurrent temozolomide and radiation therapy followed by adjuvant temozolomide. There were improvements of survival based on the combined treatment strategy. And the practice has been, there's, there's been additional data to show that this approach is beneficial in not only glioblastoma, but in anaplastic astrocytoma, so grade three tumors. But in addition, this data has been extrapolated to diffuse midline gliomas, even though there hasn't really been randomized trials in the adult setting to look at this question. The pediatric provider approach varies a little bit, and um, of course, this is somewhat dependent on the individual provider, but I just wanted to share the studies to think about here. Um, one thing to note is that regardless of the treatment, the pediatric um, in the AYA patients, it's important to consider what they're getting for treatment now and whether that excludes them for certain trials later on. So even though some pediatric providers would prefer not to give concurrent temozolomide um, for upfront therapy. There are many adult clinical trials that require that treatment for enrollment. So it's an important thing and kind of a unique thing to consider in this population. So in pediatric high-grade glioma, there's really unclear benefit in using temozolomide. Um, Unfortunately, most of the studies that are performed looking at this question really compare to historical control, so they're not randomized control trials. This particular trial, ACNS126 here, was a mirror of the STUP protocol, and it was comparing that regimen, again, with concurrent radiation Temodar with adjuvant Temodar, to an older regimen of radiation by itself plus CCNU and vincristine. So the difference here is multifold. One, this isn't a randomized trial. Two, um, there's no concurrent therapy with the older trial during radiation. And three, we're com compa comparing two different treatment regimens, two different chemotherapy regimens. There wasn't a difference seen in these two treatment strategies with some variation dependent on MGMT expression. However, some people say that this is not sufficient evidence to show that temozolomide could not be efficacious in this population. So there's quite a bit of variation in practice as to whether providers incorporate concurrent temozolomide with radiation therapy, and even if they go on to do adjuvant temozolomide therapy. This is another PDF trial that mirrors the NOAA-09 trial that Dr. Bush discussed, and this involves the addition of CCNU with adjuvant temozolomide. There does seem to be a statistically significant impact by adding the CCNU um, that is perhaps more substantial than what was seen in the adult trial. And this difference is even further separated out um, according to MGMT expression. So uh, there is some equipoise as to whether or not this should be incorporated in the upfront treatment. And there are definitely centers that use this strategy. Of course, um, you have to consider the toxicity that is involved in using both of these agents, especially the pulmonary toxicity with CCNU. There's been quite a bit of work on midline gliomas in pediatric patients. Um, it's a much more prevalent histology in that age group compared to adults. And when they looked at temozolomide added to radiation therapy, or frankly, any other kind of chemotherapy, there wasn't a significant impact control compared to historical control, such as CCG9941, which was radiation only. So um, many providers do not use temozolomide with radiation therapy for midline gliomas specifically. 
So what is the difference in survival that we're seeing in these patients, pediatric compared to adult and the AYA population? Surely it's not just a difference in treatment strategy and there are important underlying molecular characteristics that could explain the difference in response to treatment and into um, survival and overall outcome. So I think everyone here has um, seen some variation of this breakdown before. This was a paper in 2012 looking at various molecular subgroups of glioblastoma, so just focusing on glioblastoma. And these subgroups were defined by both genetic and epigenetic features. You can see the prominent mutations here at the top, which were thought to be tumor driving mutations in these subgroups. Um, of course, you know, these different subgroups can be seen across different age groups. There's always exceptions, but there is often a predilection for certain subgroups to be appearing in various age groups. So for example, EGFR amplication, which is often identified as one of, one of the primary markers in glioblastoma is seen in older adults, as you can see in the age histogram here, whereas variants in the histone 3 protein, K27 and G35, are much more common in younger populations. And our AYA patients are seeing a lot of these mutations. As you can see here, here's a summary of how they behave just looking at patient survival, and there can be a difference in these. It does come down, it is more than just the, the one tumor driving mutation. And we're still at the tip of the iceberg, I think, in understanding the molecular features that drive these tumors. It's not just the genetic information because we know that glioblastomas, both spontaneous and secondary, have really limited uh, genomic mutations. We're learning more and more about the epigenetic behavior of these tumors. But here's one example where at our group, we looked at the behavior of K27, H3K27M mutant tumors. So again, this is a mutation in the histone 3 protein. And um, traditionally, this has been associated with poor survival outcomes in pediatric patients, where it's a much more prevalent tumor type. So you can see here in the orange curve, this is historical data looking at their survival over time. And many studies estimate 10 to 14 months median survival in these patients. We found here in our group of about 60 patients um, referred to and seen at UCSF that adult patients over the age of 18 have a much longer survival, medium survival of about 28 months. And so obviously significantly different from the pediatric population. And when we compare to IDH wild type glioblastomas that do not have the histone 3 mutation, they fare better than those as well. So clearly it's not just one molecular alteration that's driving the behavior of these tumors. And we have a lot more to unpack and understand about why these tumors behave the way they do. So there's been a lot of excitement about targeted treatments, precision medicine. How can we better utilize the information we have about the molecular features of these tumors to direct therapy and help these patients? Just going back to this histone 3 K27M mutation, so there's been a lot of work in, in the pediatric population in particular, looking at how we can target this pathway. The Okada Lab and some other partners here at UCSF have developed a targeted peptide vaccine and diffuse midline gliomas for pediatric patients, which is currently in clinical trial right now. You can see one example patient here um, with a pontine midline glioma, previously known as a DIPG. So you can see with time after vaccination, the, the tumor has gone down. Um, and then the flare signal, flare T2 signal, seems to go up again, although this might be attributed to increases in the immune infiltrate that's happening in the tumor. So this is still in study, and it's a very exciting technology um, for these patients that previously really didn't have any treatment to rely on. There are other inhibitors, um, of course, of this pathway. ONC201 is one that you'll hear about. Um, this is a small molecular inhibitor 
which targets the DRD2 pathway upstream of apoptosis regulation and some proliferative cell proliferative pathways. It was actually originally tested in all high-grade gliomas, but there seemed to be a, a higher impact in midline gliomas. So they've sort of focused that and have been working out the mechanism of how it might interact with H3K27M. But again, this is in clinical trial. ONC201 was developed by the Oncoceutics company. It's important with AYA patients, I think, to think a little bit more broadly about molecular alterations. Um, this is sort of across the board the case with, with all of our brain tumors, but of note, there are several fusion proteins that are more prevalent in the AYA population. This is listing all fusion proteins that have been described in various types of high-grade glioma. And in particular, I just want to highlight that um, NTRAC fusions and MET, MET fusions can be quite common in the pediatric high-grade gliomas. And that also extends into the AYA group. This is important to think about both diagnostically because it can help us understand what histology the tumor actually is, but also because there are some FDA approved therapies that can be used off label to target these fusions. And um, so those are shown in green. And there are treatments that are tissue agnostic, such as entrectinib and larotrectinib, meaning they're targeting the entract fusions. Um, but can be used as an FDA indicated medication in any tumors that have this alteration. So a very important thing to think about with these patients. Um, just wanna switch gears briefly and talk about cancer predisposition syndromes, which can often manifest tumors in this AYA population. One that's um, of interest here and near and dear to my heart is neurofibromatosis. This is of course an autosomal dominant condition in which tumors arise along peripheral nerves and in the central nervous system. The manifestations can present at various times of life from birth to adulthood, can include peripheral tumors as well as CNS tumors and malignant peripheral tumors. It takes a multidisciplinary team to think about these patients and take care of these patients. And we've already developed quite a um, list of collaborators here at UCSF that are invested in taking care of these patients. Just wanted to highlight my partner, Lynn Jack, who is a wonderful peripheral neurosurgeon in the department. We see patients together on Wednesday afternoons, and she provides a lot of relief to patients through her peripheral neurosurgery interventions. So it's been great to build this program. There are more options becoming available for these patients. Um, Selimatinib is a newer MEK inhibitor that was recently approved for plexiform neurofibromas, which is a particularly difficult neurofibroma to surgically operate and remove, but can cause a lot of impact to quality of life in these patients. So in the pediatric SPRINT trial, there was improvements in PFS, um, also radiographic and response. And more importantly, these patients have improved pain and quality of life. So we've actually begun to use this in our adult NF patients off label. And I've had several patients had success on this treatment. So I know we're running short on time, but in summary, the AYA population is a really unique and vulnerable population that deserves our, our care and attention. They have unique needs based on their tumor histologies and the long-term effects of treatment. And then neurofibromatosis in particular is one syndrome that can affect these patients and um, require multidisciplinary care. Thank you.